So um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Natalie Meebach. And um, I don't know if anyone's had a chance, Natalie's had a little stall over in that area um, to have a look at her work. She's an artist. Um, she is an artist who kind of explores this intersection between um, uh, science and art. And what she does is she takes environmental data and she translates it into tangible um, artworks, sculpt sculptures and uh, uh, musical scores. And uh, you might be wondering why we invited um, uh, her here. And I think that one, one of the key reasons is that as we kind of experience this tidal wave of data, which is sort of transforming our business, it's incumbent upon us to be able to communicate what that data means in a more compelling way, both internally within our, within our own um, agencies, if you work in agencies, uh, to clients, um, and indeed potentially to end users. And if, like me, your data visualization skills kind of extend just beyond creating a, 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 a sort of pivot table and a bar chart, then really I think what we need to do is um, seek some inspiration when we're trying to deliver the story that that data represents. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, Natalie will, uh, will provide some of that inspiration. I should mention a bit about her bio. She's another massive overachiever. Um, she uh, has had uh, exhibited all over the world. She's uh, got residences and uh, won numerous awards. She's a global TED fellow. Um, do check out her uh, TED talk, um, which is a, a delightful way to spend 10 minutes. Um, and I'm hoping that the next 25 minutes or so will be as delightful. So everyone, please give Natalie a big hand. Thank you very much for sticking around. Um, it's always nice to be at the end of the program, and you never know what you're going to get. So thank you for, for still being here. Um, just to make it even more enticing for you to watch the TED Talk, it's not 10 minutes, it's four minutes. So <laughs> it's even better than that. Um, I did promise that I would not go over 30 minutes. I'm going to try to get it to 25 minutes. If I speed up in the end, it's because I'm trying to keep to that timing because I'm aware that we have a panel and people have to go places. So I want to start by, first of all, thanking Ben Silcox for inviting me to uh, come speak to you. Um, ben t uh, called me up, and I get invited to a lot of different venues to speak about data and art. And one, of, one thing I'm always looking for is how do they think about art? Are they, and how do, how do they think about data? Are they critically involved in this conversation? And I loved some of the questions that Ben was asking. And it really made me very curious to come to this uh, conference and uh, share with you some of my viewpoints, but also, more importantly, hear what you have to say about data. I love people who think critically about data. So um, thank you, Ben, for having me. Also, thank you, Kate and Joanna, for making everything possible on, on the logistics side of it for me coming. So let me just start, before I show you the slides, I want to just make a connection between you and me. Um, I'm a full-time artist, and I exhibit all over, the, uh, all over the place. And I deliberately show my work to a lot of different audiences. So I go out of my way not to just show the work to art audiences or craft audiences, but I go to science conferences, technology conferences, data visualization conferences. I, I speak to a lot of teachers. And I do this because everybody accesses data in a different way. And so I talk to a lot of different people. Um, I don't come from a marketing background, but I think what we do share in common is that we're all trying to make connections to a very diverse audience using data as a vehicle to build content about a product or an idea. And in my case, I'm trying to get people to think about the weather. Sounds simple, but it's actually not that easy. So I've crafted this talk to, um, to in a sense, lead uh, to some of the questions that we're going to talk about in the panel in, in near, near the very end. So I hope that you'll see that connection. So let me just uh, say a little bit about this slide here. I've been translating now data into sculptures, uh, woven sculptures using basket weaving as, as my main method of translation for over 13 years. It started with astrophysics and then ended up now with weather where I'm sort of stuck in. And it always begins in the same way. It begins with me extracting information from an environment, either using my own data collecting devices or going to the internet and collecting the, uh, the data there and then translating it into these woven forms or musical scores. At the very beginning when I started, art was very much in the service of science and data. And it was very important that the, the work explained something that the data was, I thought, revealing. And this relationship has changed now. Now it's much more about using data to eke out a nuance of experience that the data might be suggesting or that might be implying. So in, in other words, I'm trying to 
make a connection, a more nuanced connection with the audience about the subject matter rather than just giving them a three-dimensional graph. So I, since this is a marketing audience, I thought I'd start with my favorite ad. Um, this is a Lego ad from the 1980s. And I bring this in because this is very important in my approach to data. I grew up with Lego. I still play with Legos, tons of Legos at home. Um, and the reason I love Legos is because that's how I learned to think. I learned to think by making things, by building things. So I tend to, tend to, I tend to see everything in components. And as a sculptor who uses scientific data, I'm very aware of the fact that the majority of the ways that we interact with data is through the digital realm, either through an iPad or an iPhone or, or a computer. There's very little that you can touch. And that, wonders, that makes me sometimes wonder whether we're not losing something in that process. So here are some of the questions that I think about in my studio, and this is hopefully what's, what's going to lead into some of the, the discussion later on. How would our understanding of data change if we could touch it, hear it, taste it, feel it, and walk around it? How do the mediums that we use to translate data affect the way we understand it? Do the digital and the physical spaces through which we communicate data through impose implied expectations on how the information will be consumed, accessed, and understood? And lastly, are we being too polite with data? And you'll hear a little bit about, more about how I think about that. So I I am trying to get people to think about weather. And nowadays, that's not so easy to do, especially in the United States. Um, the problem with weather is that it isn't a neutral subject anymore. It's very much linked to the topic of climate change. And in the US, this, the, especially on a national level, the topic of climate change is very much wedded with political rhetoric, political opinions uh, on either side. And it's also really, there's a lot of misinformation and almost too much information about that subject. And so people don't really know how to talk about it and they feel very uncomfortable about it. And, um, and now the quote below here says, there's a scientific and ideological language for what is happening to the weather, but there are hardly any intimate words. And this, is a, this comes from an essay that Zadie Smith wrote in the New York Review of Books in April 2014. And what she calls for is something that I really believe in, and that is she calls for a, a diversification of mediums, approaches, and spaces through which we speak about the weather or climate change in order to allow metaphors, analogy, and nuances to emerge within the science. And in my work, that's very much what I'm trying to do. I find that if I throw data at people, they, can't di they don't want to digest it, they can't digest it in the way that is meaningful to them. So I'm constantly in this quest of finding more intimate ways that people can engage with the subject of weather, but still infuse it with that scientific story. So here's an example of how I do that. What you just heard are the interactions of temperature, wind, and barometric pressures that were recorded in Hurricane Noel in 2007. The musicians played up a musical score just like this uh, that is entirely made out of weather data. So every, every single colorful bead, every single colorful strand here represents some sort of data variable. And together, it's not only a three-dimensional graph of the data, but it also infuses it with a musical notation system that musicians can read off and play. And it's the same thing with this. This guy is the same uh, data set, just different interpretation of it. A lot of my work looks very playful, and I was asked earlier, is this for kids? And you know, how do kids think about this work? Um, the, play, the work is very playful for a very specific reason. I'm trying to lure you into this information without immediately framing it as being scientific. So I want you to enter this world through that language of construction toys, of play, of, of just kind of thinking through making. And then once you're in it, you realize that all these colorful cars, all these beads, and all these strands actually refer to a specific data variable. So underneath all that um, colorful chaos is actually a numerical logic that holds it together. It's a way of luring the viewer in, in a more, I think, um, unthreatening way. 
So, but my bread and butter really is weather data. And I look at a lot of this kind of weather data, very numerical stuff. Um, and I think of weather data as always a kind of distillation when it comes in that format, because weather is an amalgam of system that's inherently invisible. We can see temperature, we can see barometric pressure, we can see wind, we can see the effects of them. And in order to make sense of weather, we distill certain aspects of that, of that interaction and, and, um, and present it in these forms. What these forms are not very good in um, displaying is how weather is a very visceral experience and how weather is also very linked to the human experience. So because I'm interested in data and building meaning out of data, I'm also interested in how, what kind of physical structures we use to explain uh, information through. And maps, I think, are very interesting visual structures because they help us organize information in a new way and they, in an order so that we can see it in, in, in a different and maybe also new way. This is a stick map from the uh, Marshall Islands. This is a navigational map. It, um, it is made out of bamboo sticks and little shells, and so what it represents are ocean swells and ocean currents. This was meant to be a device that people would go and memorize before they went on, on their journey from one island to the next, so this wasn't meant to be taken onto the canoe. But I like how distilled this is. This, the, the physical structure is actually built by the behaviors. Another map I really like are these wooden pieces, which are um, pieces that are about four or five inches long, maybe like this 10 centimeters maybe, um, that show an exaggerated carved coastline of Greenland. So the idea was that you would be in, in, in this canoe, you would have this piece of, um, you would have this piece of wood in, inside your mitten and you could feel just by touch where along the horizon you were actually in reference to the coastline. I like how they still they are and how they still communicate something tactile. This is another project that I find uh, fascinating. This is Karen Schaefer's 9-11 World Trade a center mapping project. Here what she's doing is she's tracing the, the path of every person who walked, who commute, commuted to one of the uh, World Trade Center towers on 9-11. So these, each line represents a personal, personal decision on whether they took the train, the bus, whether they stopped for coffee. And these are their paths and they all lead to this tower which of course we all knew collapsed. And what I'm interested in here is that these behaviors again build a larger structure and as a sculptor what I see is a basket. What I see is a woven form. So we sort of always see what we want to see. Uh, Manuel Lima wrote this really great book uh, on visual complexity. And Manuel Lima is a designer who looks a lot at how internet, how web designers organize information. And one of the things that he has um, come to the conclusion is that this organizing principle of the tree, which is a very common one since the Sumerians, where you have this one beginning of a core and then you have these, these um, things that evolve from the core is really no longer a very useful way of mapping information because it's not lo no longer how we really understand it. So what the, things, the way that we see information interacting nowadays is much more in this kind of manner, in these matrices that are influencing one another. Well, when I see the matrices and when I see this, I see this, which is the, bas the beginnings of baskets. And which is really interesting because basket weaving is very, very old and um, again, you can make these very easily tactile. So as a person who works in sculpture and who associates mainly with um, people in the craft world, one of the things that I find ironic is that in the craft world when you learn about material, the first thing you learn is that you have to fail with it a thousand times. If you want to learn about wood, you have to fail with it. If you want to learn about metal, you have to you have to kind of distort it and break it in a million ways in order to understand it. And when I teach weaving, this is the material that I work with, this is reed. When I teach weaving, I always tell my students, you have to break it in order to understand it, in order to understand the parameters that this material has. If you don't, you'll never know where that boundary is. And I find that we don't do that with data. And I'm sort of testing your Star Trek uh, new generation um, thing here. But it, when you do this with data, when you start to play with data, when you start to distort it, when you start to twist it, when you start to create metaphors with it, narrative with it, very quickly you go into this field of bad data where it's no longer seen as legitimate. And I find that very dangerous because I find that if we don't do that, if we don't fail more often with data and allow these failures to be visible, then 
we will never really understand the potential of what data is. Where are the parameters of data? So one of the things that I feel, especially in the creative business, is that we as creative people, designers, artists, whatever you may call yourself, we need to be more courageous in the way that we uh, use data and the way that we let it fail. And we have to also let it fail in public in order to generate that discussion. So how did it all start? A lot of people have asked me how the heck I started, how did this business with science and basket weaving come about. So I'm going to quickly sh show you that. It started with astronomy. And astronomy is the deepest of space in the deepest of time. And yet, all you ever get are these two-dimensional images projected on a screen like this. So as, again, as a kinesthetic learner, and remember how many kids learn to play with Legos and how Lego and construction toys is the way that we, we operate when we're eight years old. But when we're adults, we stop doing that. And but here's the science that is all about space and time, and yet everything you get is flat. And you can't go out and touch a star. You can't jump in a spaceship and zip around. So when I was con learning this, I wanted to find a way of making this somehow tactile. And I was taking a basket weaving class at the time, and I thought, well, why not weave a basket? This is the only way I will truly understand it. So I was, under I was interested in the spatial relation between the sun, the earth, and the moon. So people were. They were already learning about quasars and neutron stars, and I was sort of still stuck in this, how the heck do we actually understand the spatial relationship? And I was looking at how uh, science communicates that through so these diagrams, and then there's diagrams where you're actually a human being, and you see these paths. And I decided that I'm going to do a, rather than write a final paper, I'm going to hand in a sculpture. So I ended up making, a, choosing a, a diagram, a graph, uh, called the hertzsprung russell diagram, which is a beautiful diagram. We, we, I was talking earlier to somebody about the beauty of diagrams. This is one of those diagrams that I be, think belongs in, in an art museum. It's simple and yet really, really powerful. You take the surface temperature or the luminosity of any star and you can figure out what the e evolutionary stage is of that star. So I took this and simply made a basket out of it. So I handed in this four foot diameter piece and he was okay with it, the professor. So, you know, it takes one open-minded person to give you that, that, um, that belief that you can actually find your own way of learning something. Uh, I switched over to weather later on, about eight years ago, and I wanted to understand how does my, inf how does my translation process with, with baskets change if I'm the one collecting the data, not some instrument that I don't have any personal relationship to. So for 18 months, I would go to this beach and collect data on a daily basis. And everybody who has collected data knows how difficult it is to get good data. It takes a lot of discipline. So I go out to the beach, collect the data, go back to my studio, compare it to weather stations, ocean buoys, climate data, and so forth, and then compile these, these clipboards, which are all um, sculptures in my studio. So from that, I began to think about the basket as this three-dimensional grid. What if the basket? is not just a form to build a model with, but actually a grid. So you have vertical and horizontal elements in the basket. And let's say I wanted to translate that data here, which shows you when the moon and the sun rises in Antarctica. So I was doing this series on the polar regions. And all I have to do is, this is really simple, uh, I'm as assigning the, the vertical values an hour of each day. So each pair is one, day, one hour. So 11 means 11 AM, 12 means noon, and 13 means 1 PM. And then all I'm doing is weaving, it's like sculpture by number. I weave when the moon rises and sets, and when the sun rises and sets. But what I discovered is that when you do this over time, because I'm using this material that has this tension, that if I exert too much pressure on it, it will break, it means that the numbers are slowly distorting and twisting that grid. It's the numbers that are revealing this form, not me imposing it. So once I have this form, which here is looking at the first slither of sunlight to the first day of 24-hour sunlight in Antarctica. I have not only a form that now interacts in space with, but I also have, in a sense, a three-dimensional calendar. So then I can go back in there and plot more things on top of it. And so here's another one. This is looking at warm winter, uh, a two-month period in, on Cape Cod, looking at air, land, and sea temperature. Air, land, and sea temperature. Yes, I said that right. Um, so again, the body itself is built up of this 24-hour cycle, um, and then the, the arms are my own data I collected, and then the, the, the butt and the top are historical data. And when you get closer, you see that same band of 24 hours that has now also been given a range of temperature. 
Here's another piece, Boston Tides. This is a tidal calendar. The inner form is sun and sunrise and moonrise data of one year. Again, those warps being done by the data. You have high and low tide readings of each day. You have the solar noon, moon phases, the solar azimuth. And what I found interesting is that these pieces started to become very awkward. People didn't know how to interact with them. You place them in a science museum, they became these data visualizations of, of tidal data. You place them in an art museum, they became these objects, aesthetic objects. You place them in a craft museum, they became, the functionality of these objects was, was kind of questioned. Um, and, and, and what I was trying to do here was trying to push people's expectations of what kind of vocabulary belongs in the world of art, science, craft, or technology. Why is this not as accurately seen as a graph? And it sort of, and everybody sort of has their own threshold of when it becomes an artistic expression versus an actual data translation. So these are some other pieces I did during that time. I'm going to speed forward a little bit. Um, this is buoy data from uh, the Bay of Fundy, trying to figure out why uh, right whales hang out in the Bay of Fundy in uh, late August. So I took buoy data and translated the conditions of these specific buoy um, spaces. Here's another piece that looks at all the data I collected that's related to the sun specifically, which of course is everything, because without the sun there's no weather. Um, but what I found was that these pieces were beautiful, but they were also very didactic. They weren't really, to me, generating a more nuanced discussion. And I think with anything, when you spend enough time with any subject matter, you start to hear echoes of something more, because maybe you want to hear something more. And I also started to become more interested in not just how instruments, whether instruments record data, but how we as human beings interpret it. I was getting more and more interested in the human mind. And so I started to think more and more about some sort of translation material that would go between the numbers and the actual sculptures. And I started to think about music. And I have to tell you that I don't play music and I don't write music, so I'm approaching this very much from um, somebody who knows nothing about music. Um, but I found that being a bit naive about something sometimes leads to really creative decisions that you might regret later on, but at least the, you made them. You, were, you had the courage to make them because you didn't know that you were courageous. So I started to think about musical notation because when you have a series of notes, you can make those 10 notes sound happy, sad, erratic, without actually changing the notes. All you're doing is changing the notation system around it. So is this a way of bringing in nuance without actually changing the information? Because that's important, that this information isn't changed for any aesthetic purpose. And then I use these scores to work with musicians who interpret these scores using the same parameters that I do, which is there are certain things I cannot change, like the data, and other things that I have to change because of the material that I'm using. So here's a, an example of a score. This is a score that um, talks about a sort of typical storm coming through New England um, and that slowly merges into a more emotional storm as a visit from my parents uh, intersected that storm. So I mean, we can both, an internal storm, sort of. Um, the, the score itself is, is literally uh, kind of like a basket grid in the sense that the middle vertical line is noon and then you have 6 p.m. and, and, tw and, and uh, midnight. And then uh, two staffs or one day's worth of data. So I'm tra translating um, humidity, temperature, and barometric pressure from my weather station. And then these <coughs> diagonal lines are actually uh, wind readings that I took. And then interspersed in all this is the tempo, which is the more subjective reading of how time actually felt doing that. Uh, weather instruments are metronomes. Human beings are not. And so how do you combine those two? into a work that still reflects the data. So here's Elaine Rambola interpreting that score.
is another score, Hurricane Noel, that you heard very early on. That's the same guy as this guy. Um, slightly different format for uh, the musical score. Maybe uh, looks a little bit more familiar in terms of it being a graph, but the same kind of principle. Three va variables that are extracted, because remember, storms are much more than barometric pressure, wind, and temperature. But I'm taking only three, and I'm, pl I'm placing them on a, on a graph, and I'm assigning each variable, each reading, a, a note on the piano keyboard. What interests me here is that you're dealing with an extreme. So this whole graph, all these values, are placed over a six octave range. Well, very few instruments can play that. So how do musicians deal with these parameters? What kind, what kind of choices do they make to still express the data without actually fudging it? And that's one of the things I love about collaborations is just seeing how everybody else deals with these parameters and it helps me then to rethink the sculpture and change it. And then this is the result, and then you, you heard that one earlier. Another thing that I really like is how um, data is often distorted by Hollywood. And um, this is a, the perfect storm was a, that is a storm that has really entered the cultural conversation in the United States, partly because of a book that was written by Sebastian Junger and also because Hollywood made a movie called The Perfect Storm. It's the story of two storm systems that interacted with one another that created this sort of meteorological wunderkind. It was something that should never happen, but did happen. These two storm systems merged energies and created this huge storm, The Perfect Storm. And the book is about a, a ship based in Gloucester near Boston that sank during that storm. So it's, there's this sort of human tragedy embedded in that storm. That storm is flooded with data. You can find so much data about that storm. But then comes Hollywood and takes that, that story and distorts it just slightly. Why is that interesting to me? Because fiction is also an interesting, has an interesting relationship to data and to fact. Uh, the sto the, 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 so I wrote a score in three acts, and each act takes weather, st weather from that particular uh, area where the, where, the, where the boat was. So it, it, it started off on the, on the right-hand side and uh, in the Flemish cap, and then uh, went back, tried to go back to Boston, and then sank somewhere near Sable Island where that green arrow is. And so the, the three acts are written to represent that, that narrative. So the first act takes weather station from the Flemish cap, pack, cap, the second one from Nova Scotia and Sable Island where the ship sank, and then the third act takes weather data from the people in Gloucester waiting for their return. What's interesting is Sable Island. Sable Island is known as the graveyard of the Atlantic. It is a small strip of land that has tons and tons of um, shipwrecks on it. And shipwrecks, they go back to the 16th, 17th century. Well, if you want to go back to the 16th, 17th, or 18th century to find out why these ships sank, you don't go to Weather Underground or Noah. You go to fishing shanties. You go to poetry. You go to fishing stories or fishing lore. And so in a weird way, fiction is a preserver of these factual events that actually happen. So it's sort of trying to combine those two. And then these are the different sculptures that originated out of that series. And I have three minutes left, so I'm going to speed forward. These are all the same score, just different interpretations, but still telling a different aspect of, of, this, of, the, of the data. The final story that I want to end with is, again, this, this, I think this push for narrative in, I think we're all storytellers. I think data really only becomes really meaningful if you can tell a good story about it. That's what connects to, to people. It's not numbers. It's the, it's the story that you build with it. And Hurricane Sandy is one of those storms that brought a lot of stories because, again, weather is so much more than, than just um, numerical data. It's also human stories in, within it. And I was interested particularly in these amusement parks that were destroyed by Hurricane Sandy. And they became, to me, emblematic images of our inability to deal with climate change and our coastal conditions. And living by the coast, you really do see things changing very drastically. But I also wanted another a narrative filter in there, and that is the, the filter of theater, the filter of Ray Bradbury's wild fiction, and to see how do these different entities build stories? How do they tell stories? And can I use their approach to storytelling in the way that I might be dealing with the data? So I ended up building these amusement parks that are completely built up of weather data. So they're literally weather graphs that you can read of the night that Sandy hit, the, hit, hit land. So they're like graphs. But then in, embedded in them are these other fictional st 
other, not fictional, there are other narratives that the data build. So for example, here you have Coney Island and Seaside Heights, two areas that were hit hard by Hurricane Sandy. And then, but then the whole thing kind of floats on a raft and then every ride there is made out of a ship. So you can read the data of today, but it's also talking about tomorrow. And here's a, a wheel, wheel of fortune you can spin, find out how many houses sink, to, depending on how many uh, sea level feet, see how high the sea level is going to rise. Um, here is a, another um, version of the, this carousel here was nearly submerged during Hur Hurricane Sandy and was completely surrounded by water. And um, this is basically a time clock telling you what happened to the sea, sur the, the sea surge and uh, the wind and barometric pressure readings. And then finally here, where you have data sets from three different locations, creating this amusement park that dissects all that data into an amusement park, literally, that is both above and below water, but that still tells the story of when ha Sandy hit, hit land. So I'm going to end here, because I'm eager to hear what the panel has to say about all this. Um, <laughs> And just to, to say that, first of all, thank you for having an artist here. I'm used to being um, invited to things where I don't quite fit in. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's really important that we talk about data, not just in our own communities, but that we invite other people that talk about data and how they might be working with data. And I think there's so much potential in working with the analytical side of data and the the part that we need to do, which is basically to translate that analytics into something that people can relate to. And the more diverse that our audience becomes and the more diverse the ways that we communicate with our audience, uh, the more I think it puts an, uh, pressure on us to come up with a lot more poetic ideas and poetic ways of bringing, making data a little bit more real than a graph might be able to do. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Natalie. Um, I'm afraid I don't think we've got time for questions. Oh, we do. Oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, a question. <coughs> Anyone have any questions for Natalie? Yes. Hello, Natalie. Thank you very much. That was one of the more unique uses of data that I've ever seen in my life. Uh, one of the things I noticed over the course of what you were doing there is your art goes from trying to stay pure to the data to becoming more, I mean, your early work is, is, is as pure to the data as, as it can possibly be. And what you get at the, at the end is you start getting more of, a, and you even said at one point, more fiction involved, more art involved. Mm -hmm. And in my personal opinion, I start to gravitate more towards the end versus the beginning. Is there a stimulus for this? Is there something that well, you've come to over the... Years? See, this is what fascinates me, because why is that? Even though I'm, in a sense, pushing this notion of, well, is this really still data or not? It's somehow, when you frame it in, in these narrative ways, it makes more of a connection to the person. And I feel like it's, and also I feel like there's a lot of, you know, uh, there are many roles for data. So there is the role for data being very analytic and very, and, and these earlier pieces that are very didactic. But there's also a role, and I think increasingly so, for more diverse applications of data. So yes, I, I connect to those later pieces too, but that doesn't mean that I don't also still do those didactic pieces. It's sort of that spectrum is, every piece kind of hits it at a different mark, and you just never quite know where it's gonna go. But it, there is a power in um, somehow allowing data to breathe maybe a little bit more and allowing those more nuanced ways of understanding it, because that's how we understand it. We're not computers. We, we bring our personal filters into all this. Brilliant. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you. Um, so I'm sorry to move you off, but if you do want to talk to Natalie, then please do grab her after this. Um, so now, thank you, Natalie. Give her another hand.